everybody. I hope you enjoyed lunch. It was a little experiment in greenhouse uh, solar there for a while in the tent, but it, it got better as we went on. I just want to welcome you back. I know people are drifting in. We have a very exciting lineup for the afternoon, and I am really looking forward to getting into some uh, serious substance here around the executive order as we go along. I first wanted to call in two of my colleagues. I don't know if they're here here. So I have two people who are looking for jobs. I am on the faculty here at George Washington University. I lead a thing called the GW Sustainability Collaborative. And I want to make sure all my people are birthed and find good homes. Uh, so uh, if you are around and you see Gina Riemenschneider or Austin Frizzell, I think they're still out at the table. Um, and you have any job opportunities you um, know of to share with them, I would be deeply appreciative. They're incredibly hard workers. So this little segment we call Managing Change, Views of Former Deputy Secretaries. I was a Deputy Secretary at the Department of Agriculture for four years, one month. So the first term of uh, President Obama. And deputies actually work hand in hand. There's a thing called the President's Management Council. And we come together fairly regularly to exchange stories, information. How are we going to manage change? How are we going to take the president's agenda and move forward? And one of the people that I worked very, very closely with and who's become a really great friend and a wonderful colleague was the deputy administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. And he recently stepped down. He is now president of an organization called C2ES. Lots of information in your brochure about that. Please welcome to the stage my friend, Bob Perciuseppe. <laughs> so it's, it's really nice to get together and we get to talk about managing change. And actually, we can just go back to our other jobs and we leave it to them, right? That's right. <laughs> That's sort of the mean part. Somebody's got to do Somebody's it. Somebody's got to do it. So we wanted to pull up a slide to show you you may remember when you registered for this event, you were asked a question. The question was, what is the most effective driver of agency sustainability actions? And we thought this would be very interesting for us to just go around this circle for a few minutes and reflect on what you all said in responding to that question. And the first thing I'm just going to know, we're going to start here with agency uh, leadership and go clockwise, but um, there's there's not really big ones and really little ones. Uh, this, this, this yellow is other, and, and that's kind of hard to talk about. It's a, sort of cats and dogs and pigs and horses and you know, a lot of different stuff. But, but otherwise, the real answer may be in there, though. <laughs> maybe that's true. <laughs> but, but otherwise, um, they're not all that different in terms of the number of people responding to yeah. a particular issue. So Bob, um, talk a little less about agency leadership and how important that is. We've got a very ambitious executive order. How do we get to those goals? Well, certainly the agency leadership, which is a ubiquitous term, isn't it? Um, <laughs> it doesn't mean like maybe just the cabinet secretary. It probably means the the other senior political leaders or non-career leaders, and also the senior executive service. I mean, I would characterize all of that as the leadership, and they have to be comfortable talking about this as a, as a routine. They, 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 it can't be like, we got another executive order, I'm passing it around, I'll send it to you in the email, uh, you know, let me know when you're done. Uh, it's gotta be something that is on the mind, on the list, on the agenda, of all those senior people, not just the political leadership, but also the career leadership. And I think that's, that's a key starting point for all of this. Yeah. Culture change. It's about culture change in part, right? You can't just send the memo. I mean, at USDA, 110,000 employees at the time when I was there, send a memo, come on. You got to walk the talk. You got to sure. um, figure out different events to actually engage people and allow people to lead. Um, I tried to do a big effort on um, moving forward issues around local and regional food systems. And I set up an interagency task force we met every two weeks. And I said, I don't want people having to be at that task force. I want the people who want to be at that task force, one person from every agency. And they did incredible things because we also gave people an opportunity to be leaders. I thought that was really. Um, yeah. Helpful. Yeah, one of the keys will be uh, having the leadership, 
and again, I want to exclude career leadership with this because they're vital, uh, is the, the issue of what happens if they are successful. So the, 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 the political and career leadership have to talk about success and how they can get there from here, have plausible paths forward, not just uh, uh, what might just seem, seem to be an unachievable goal. So it has to translate the executive order into actions that are relevant to the agency, to the divisions, to the offices, to the branches, to the sections, to the facilities. And I think uh, the next uh, subject here the, the, on staff will be another important component of how you get to that piece of information. Okay, I'm going to say one more thing about leadership. I loved um, everything Secretary Mavis said this morning. He's just really one of my heroes. He's so articulate. He's so committed to sustainability. He has done so much. And later on, I get to introduce Administrator Gina McCarthy. I mean, what a great day I am having. Um, but I just want to say that um, I really resonated with one of the stories that he told. It's like, how do you um, set up portals? How do you set up systems so everybody in the department or the agency can pipe up their ideas? I remember seeing this at the beginning of the first term for the president, where they had the SAVE Awards. And USDA, one of our employees, was one of the uh, people who got in the top three. I don't think they finally got the tip of the top award, but in the, in the um, very top. And it was someone who saw FedEx boxes um, for samples, for food safety samples. Um, they would send the, um, the samples necessarily to the lab in a FedEx box, but then the box would be sent back in the same way when it was empty. And they just thought about that. It's like this rank and file person. They thought, that doesn't make any sense. We made the change and saved 100 grand. Now, 100 grand is not um, a big amount of money when you're talking about a department as large as USDA. But if everyone piped in their ideas on sustainability yeah. in the same way, just think of what the opportunities are. So Bob Lita, staff commitment education, what are you thinking? Well, well first of all, uh, we already said that senior leadership uh, particularly career leadership, have to be able to communicate down in staff meetings and make sure that they're next in line. Uh, supervisors are also bringing me up at their staff meetings. But the, then you have to start going the other way, getting the ideas from the staff. You know, the, the education process, um, I think, happens best when it's interactive and when uh, you're engaging the staff, which you just talk, gave a story about uh, what uh, Secretary Mabus was talking about, I can give a, a story at EPA where um, in, in the last couple of years, uh, of course I haven't been there for about nine months, but they may have changed this, but uh, we created a system called GreenSpark where it was sort of a crowdsourcing process where uh, you could put out a question, staff could respond on social media, and you could have the, a system that accumulate the ideas. And one of the ideas that came out of this was related to our story earlier with Tappet and the bottle, the blue bottles that I think everybody now has. Um, uh, the idea is that there were very few kitchens in EPA that you could go and fill your bottle up, and there were water fountains, but the water fountains, you couldn't get the the bottle under. And so the idea was that as we fixed water fountains over time to change them so you could actually fill up bottles. And that's actually been implemented. That was an idea from staff. So the, the, the idea of engaging staff and getting their commitment and seeing their, their ideas implemented, um, I think is a, is a really important part of the education and getting staff commitment. If, they, if they're just being told what to do, um, that has some degree of success, but if they're coming up with ideas that actually get adopted by managers and in, implemented, that is even more powerful. Excellent. Okay, the next one is funding and costs, and we used to both have to oversee the budget. I mean, <laughs> that's tough. And we heard from our Clean Dream panel this morning that you know we need to be working on finding ways to facilitate these various financing models. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, funding is interesting. Uh, in theory, you're saving money uh, because you're being more efficient, you're lose, using less materials. But as many people have pointed out, you often have to spend a little to get it. And one way to do that in the budget process is to uh, develop internally in the agency, and this is something that I think OMB has to get a handle on as well, but you just you develop something internally that if a certain part of the agency, let's say a facility, an office, an outpost, a lab, uh, 
comes up with a new approach to materials management or energy, and they actually save, they, they save money doing it, and you allow them to make the investment you know, in the budget, when the budget process is going on, that they are able to, some of those savings stay in the, off, in, the, in the division, in the section, in the facility, so that they can improve their programmatic work, which is underfunded everywhere in the, in the, in the federal government. So if there's a way to get these savings to both benefit the federal government as a whole and improve the, the provision of the programs that the, that the employees are working on, I think that is a huge driver and a way to be innovative about funding in the federal, federal budget. Excellent. And maybe part of what we can do in our post-deputy life, we, we have a few more hours in our days now, not that many, but a few more. Maybe we can also work in talking to some of the members of Congress about the need for thinking through appropriations yeah. structures so that there's uh, better pathways yeah. for some of those large upfront capital yeah. investments. All right, so congressional executive management mandate. You see, I just sort of slipped right in. We got this big uh, executive order. That's all about today. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Congress. Certainly, um, we're here because of an executive order. And maybe that's the, I can, I, this is both a brand now apparently as well as a word. We, the, the Uber way to start this is uh, <laughs> in terms of agency leadership, uh, which is in the, there, you have to have the agency leadership as we pointed out, but the, our, our former government here, we have a president and we have a Congress who are the key leaders of our, of our government and they have to be sending these signals. And, and um, I'm thinking a, in a large uh, legislative body, there's always going to be mixed signals, and I'm not trying to make any statement about that. There's always going to be mixed signals because there's you know hundreds of people with lots of different points of view. So it does fall on the executive to some extent to be that that bellwether and send that out there. And certainly, in my time in, in federal government, even in the '90s, uh, um, there's a reason there's a big number at, on the executive order uh, list uh, uh, that there's been a lot of executive <laughs> orders. And, and uh, that is not an inappropriate thing for the, the leader of a, a very a several million person workforce to put out uh, executive orders on how to uh, move forward. So I think it's a very important thing to set the tone, to set the direction. Excellent. So um, last one I just want to mention is about goals and metrics. And I know when President Obama came in as deputies, we were under a lot of pressure to do high performance priority goals. They've changed the wording around a little bit. But what I really found working with people is uh, metrics really can help with evaluation and drive change. But on the same hand, the things that you really want to measure sometimes are hard to measure. And so we, we, we get these metrics that in the end I was very dissatisfied with. They were sort of meaningless. And so this executive order has a lot of challenging metrics built in that these guys are going to have to deal with. Yeah. Any advice? Well, certainly um, I, one key advice is don't, don't create two separate ways to do metrics. Don't create metrics for this executive order and also metrics that you're required to do under the Government Performance and Result Act. You've got to merge them together. Otherwise, you've got two separate processes going on inside the agency. And that, doesn't, that leads to other additional confusion. So merging them together, we, uh, at, at EPA, we created a, 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 a cross-cutting set of, of objectives. Uh, in addition to the you know, clean air, clean water, we had you know, operational types of cross-cutting uh, initiatives, and one of those being uh, sustainability. And so you have a way, and when you're looking at your government's performance, or GIPRA as we all come to know it, uh, if you're looking at those uh, metrics in there to work these in in a way that uh, creates a unified uh, system of, of measurement. Now, the other rule of thumb I used to use with staff who work very hard and, and fruitfully on, on, these pro on this part of what an agency needs to do, because it's also part of how we communicate with the public on what we're doing, which is really important when you're in public service, is that if we don't have the perfect measure, and it's going to take a couple of years to develop the per perfect member, me measure, you have some kind of surrogate that can give you the, what I would call the line of sight to where you want to go. If you 
are doing well on this measure, you know you're going in that direction. And so there, there are ways to build momentum toward better measurement, even if you can't invest in building the measurement system you need to have today. So two points. Don't create a separate measurement system, combine it with the ones we must do by law and to communicate with the public on. And second, if you don't have perfect measures, create one that gets you going in the right direction. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to say, Jenna and Austin, raise your hands. I already talked about you earlier. Those are my job seekers, guys. Um, thank you, Bob. We look forward to net the networking reception tonight to talk with all of you in more detail about the challenges you face. Thank you. <laughs>